that changed a lot for me. So uh, I think uh, LP investing is amazing. I think it's better than stock market investing uh, because a lot of these sponsors, they have an edge, they have an advantage. And I like being a part of that. The downside is that there's generally not much liquidity. Uh, now you can get a pref where you're getting paid cash flow on a monthly basis, which is great. And some of them are 8% pref. But in general, if you know something happens in your life and you're like, I would like my money back now, please. Uh, like in the equity markets, you can't do that um, as an LP. All right, welcome to another episode of the Legacy Wealth Podcast, where we help accredited business owners become educated and get access to private investments. We do this by providing insight and access to successful fund managers and investors across multiple asset classes. Said another way, uh, our promise to you is that by listening to this show, you'll learn how to get access to the high returns of private investments without losing your shirt. I'm your host, Pascal Wagner, and today we have Dan Nunny, and uh, I'm excited to have him here today. Welcome, Dan. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so I'm going to do a quick bio on Dan. Dan is a, a former corporate attorney turned e-commerce entrepreneur and real estate investor. He's started multiple seven and eight figure e-commerce businesses that uh, sell parts uh, and accessories for different recreational vehicles, uh, one of which I know is golf carts. The other I know is, I think it's ATVs, uh, but you can you can correct me. And then uh, Dan's also a general partner of uh, the Long Game Fund, where he invests in the picks and shovels of the Bitcoin and crypto gold rush. He's invested in over 20 deals and uh, I'm excited to have him here on the show. So Dan, let's um, let's dive into... What is your story related to investing in funds? So you, you actually like your story of uh, when you quit your job. Maybe we start there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I guess I'll give you a little bit of background. I'm, uh, I'm 38. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I'm married. I've got three kids. So that keeps me super busy. Um, you know, when I grew up, I sort of always had the dream to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to own my own business. Uh, I think it's because I didn't like being told what to do. I wanted to do whatever I wanted. And, um, you know, I went to business school. I went to Indiana University. And when I graduated, I started my first business. And it was an epic failure. Uh, I spent a year on it. Uh, no success, no traction. I learned a lot. And then I sort of had this, um, like, winding path in my 20s where I went from, you know, starting a business to working at a hedge fund, going to law school. Uh, working as a corporate attorney and just kind of, uh, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted. Um, so my, I guess my first real, real job was as a corporate attorney. I worked in Chicago at a big firm and, um, you know, it was, it was a grind. Like it was, uh, 2200 hours a year for attorneys is a lot. It's, it's hard to describe that, but that's like, you know, 60 to 80 hours a week nonstop. Um, I was sort of that associate uh, for anybody that has bought or sold a business. I worked in M and A, and so I was the associate that was putting together the deal in the late nights. Um, you know, finding all the signature pages, putting it all together, and um, and that was good learning. I, I learned a whole lot. But you know, I worked next to this guy, and this is a story I always tell that um, he was kind of the worst attorney in the entire office of like seven hundred attorneys, and I was right next to him. And anytime somebody would go into their office, yeah, he'd start screaming and people would sort of shudder to get away from him. And what do they say? Like, you're, you're like the five people that you hang out with the most. And so I was worried I was going to turn into that guy. And so, um, so I sort of had thoughts of, um, you know, trying again at uh, starting a business. And so I basically quit. I, I had a really great paying job. It was a, you know, six figure job. And um, I was sort of set. I just had my first child and I decided, you know, if I'm going to make the attempt at it again, I've got to do it now. And so what I always tell people is that uh, right after I quit, I, I, uh, I printed out a picture of this guy and I framed it and I put it in my closet <laughs> and every single morning I would look at it and, you know, just like I am never going back there. I'm never going back. And so I still have that photo. And uh, it's funny because uh, it's in my office and, and my kids draw mustaches all over this guy's face. He has no idea. 
but um, but it, it was good motivation to uh, to get me going. So that's that's kind of that's kind of the quitting my job story. Yeah. So so you quit your job. You uh, then you know were basically said I'm going to make this business work, uh, and you started this e-commerce business, and that then grew uh, obviously now to the point when you've been able to bring in excess cash flow to start investing. So now, uh, kind of walk walk us through that point to why funds how did you get into funds yeah uh you know it took a few years to really get uh all the systems and processes in place in my business to the point where i didn't have to spend every single minute in it um you know so i got away from the uh you know exchanging time for money which is what i was doing as an attorney uh i I sort, sort of was doing that at the beginning of the business but now i don't have to do that and so a couple years in I started to have excess cash flow and I'm like, well, what do I do with this? Right. I, you know, this internet business could sort of to go to nothing. I need to have something else in, in the back of my pocket. So <clears throat> I, I read all the books that everybody reads, rich dad, poor dad, all the real estate books. I sort of went down the rabbit hole there and I started buying, um, you know, single family units. And then, uh, I bought, I think a double. So I had, I had five or six rental properties in the Cleveland area. And even though I had a property manager, as you know, it's it's not exactly passive, right? I have to get every call about uh, the toilet overflowed and the tenants pissed and this tenants not paying and they're leaving and they damaged it and all that stuff. And what do you want to do? So, do you want to cover this expense? Do you? Yeah, right. right. And, then, and then the property ma- manager, oh, he's got his, uh, you know, his cousin that's doing the work, and you know, it's like it's just a headache. So uh, for me, it. it it, it was good. I, I ended up doing okay on that. I ended up selling them all um, recently, but I sort of thought, well, this it's got to be easier than this. And and I think listening to some of the real estate podcasts, a bunch of guys were talking about syndication. This was in 2018, 2019. And I thought, well, this is a lot easier. I can get into a deal. I can own a piece of a, an apartment building and I don't have to do anything. I just have to cut a check. So that was, that was kind of the idea is that I don't want to manage these rentals anymore. I want to just get into a fund, let the, let the pros do it and get my return, which is probably going to be better than doing it myself, uh, which was the case. Yeah. So, so started getting into to learning about all these different asset classes. Why funds over the equities market, stocks? Uh, you know, out of all the different instruments and and things that you could invest into, why that? Yeah, I, you know, I had looked and, at that in the and, past. And actually, let me uh, before I cut you off. You know, uh, what uh, what's the makeup of that portfolio? Like, is it mostly in private investments, or? Yeah, I would say uh, majority in private investments. Um, I don't know. I just always the stock market just felt so random and uh didn't have as much control uh i like control as an entrepreneur and i just uh, i sort of like also like the idea especially with the real estate deals where uh they would pass along some of the depreciation as well so that was sort of in the back of my mind um you know at one point i was a a real estate professional for a year or two so that was something i was really thinking about was getting into these funds and then i'm able to you know bring back a lot of the passive losses into active losses so um so yeah i mean i i i first started out i think in 2018 and i i honestly i picked the i picked i started listening to grant cardone like a lot of people he was my first lp investment a very small check right like um you know, looking at it now, it's like, yeah, I would, you know, I didn't do it again after that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but like to, to, to his credit though, he's paid every single month for the last five years and all is good. Right. It hasn't, it's been a, it's been a good deal, but, um, but that was the first one I got into a multifamily, um, syndication. I think it was a fund where there were multiple assets. So I thought that was great. Hey, I get to own a, a very small sliver of a couple of these, you know, pristine assets. So, uh, that, that was the first one. Yeah, similar to you. Uh, I mean, w- one when I got into the game, I wanted to just understand how the professionals ran their funds. And Grant Cardone was honestly only the biggest, the biggest influencer I knew in the space that had one. And I, same thing, that was my first investment in Grant okay, Cardone. There you go. Fund. Yeah, Mr. Tennis. So, yep. Yeah. So, so maybe not the um, 
you know, highest returns, but I, I resonate like consistent, you know, cash flow and, and reporting is awesome. And I, I think they're uh, a great fund to, uh, be a good pillar, you know, like uh, of what a great fund looks like. Uh, okay. So, so that first fund, uh, was in multifamily with Grant Cardone. How does, how does, how did your investing journey then change, right? Like you, you've started investing in funds, your eyes opened up and, you know, you didn't just do one, you've done 20. So walk uh, me through how you started picking which funds you'd go into. What was your process? Yeah. Um, so I think what I was really looking for was um, diversification <clears throat> across asset classes, sponsors, and then um, geography. So those are the three things that I was really thinking about. Um, the way that I sort of came across <clears throat> a lot of the funds was that I was a member of two different um, private investor groups. I think one is called 506 um, investor group and another's, I think it's like the private investor group, you know, very generic sounding names, but, uh, you would get in here and it's all accredited investors. And, um, they basically would do diligence. Uh, there'd be hundreds of them doing diligence on all of these deals. So, um, so I'd take a look and I'd say, well, you know, I, I did a multifamily deal. How about a self storage deal? I don't have any of that. Right. And so it was kind of, I would go down the line one by one by one. Um, and the great thing about these is that uh, you've got literally hundreds of people doing diligence, and then um, they would bring the sponsors on to do a presentation. And if they got enough money um, pulled together, you would get preferential terms. So instead of let's say getting like a, a 65 35 or a you know 70 30 split, um, you could get class A shares and get an 80 20 because you were a part of this group and you brought a bunch of money. And so I did that for a number of the deals that I was in. We we got uh, preferential treatment, which was great. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever think, oh man, I think the economy is doing X, or you know, I think interest rates are going to go up in the future, so I'm going to start investing in this asset class, or, or is it just you know I want to invest in one of every asset class for diversification and just understand the of what's happening when, once I invest. Yeah. You know, even in 2018, 2019, everybody was saying this is a terrible time to invest because the real estate market has run up so much. And then obviously we look back, you know, five or six years, whatever, however long it is. And that was a great time to invest. Right. And <clears throat> so I wasn't really thinking about that. It was more like you said, I just, you know, I got some multifamily. Okay. I did a couple of those. I want some self storage. I want a mobile home park and then kept going down the line and so for me, it really didn't matter what the economy was doing. I was just like, hey, I'm going to put the minimum in. I want to uh, not only get a, a, a little slice of this asset class, but um, learn from each of these sponsors because I get all of their emails. And so I'm learning uh, you know, how they run their businesses and, and about these asset classes, which I knew almost nothing about beforehand. Yeah. Now, now that you've invested in, in the gamut, I mean, I have a list here of, of all the things you've invested into it. I'm just going to go down multifamily, mm -hmm. self storage, mobile home parks, retail, ATM, Bitcoin mining, VCs, uh, hotels, cannabis, debt lending, assist living, uh, crypto in general, and then also just distressed real estate. Is there now, do you currently have an affinity towards uh, specific asset classes? Uh, and if so, why? And how'd you get there? Yeah, you know. I would say the vast majority of those were in 2018, 2019, and early 2020. And then when the sort of the, the COVID crash happened in the stock market, that changed a lot for me. So uh, I think uh, LP investing is amazing. I think it's better than stock market investing uh, because a lot of these sponsors, they have an edge, they have an advantage. Um, and, I, and I like being a part of that. The downside is that there's generally not much liquidity. Uh, now you can get a pref where you're getting paid cash flow on a monthly basis, which is great. And some of them are eight percent pref. But in general, if you know something happens in your life and you're like, "I would like my money back now, please," uh, like in the equity markets, you can't do that um, as an LP. And so I was, I, I think I was a little bit too heavily invested as an LP. And so. <clears throat> 
at that time, uh, about three years ago, I started to think, well, I want to get invested in some things that are, you know, I have a little bit more control over. And so uh, for most people that know me, that that's in the Bitcoin space. And so that's where I spend a lot of time. And so I haven't done as many funds. Um, I still have done a number every single year. And I think they're probably more in the crypto space and the VC space than they were 2018, 2019, 2020. They were more real estate based. Uh, and I think that's just because I've evolved a little bit as an investor. Yeah. So I, let's go down the rabbit hole. Of like, why do you like that asset class so much? So this is the now. crypto asset class. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just, um, you know, it's such, it's still such a small asset class at like a trillion dollars. And there's just so much innovation happening there. It's really, really exciting. It's, there's constantly uh, new things happening. And I know a lot of people are sort of bearish on the space. But, um, you know, we, we sort of look at it, it, it seems to operate on a four year cycle, at least it has uh, two or three times before. And so um, I sort of believe that it's kind of like the next wave of the internet, right? It's just an iteration on the internet. And at first, there was sort of all these crashes that happened in the dot com bubble, right? And there was pets, pets com and all this stuff that didn't work out. But then there were all these really premier businesses like you know, Amazon that made it through and then Facebook that started after it. And it's at Google that started before. And so I sort of think that um, that wave is going to happen again in the crypto space. I just think that eventually there, there will not be crypto businesses. It'll just be, it'll just be businesses. All businesses use crypto in some way. Um, and I think mostly it's probably Bitcoin, uh, but there are interesting things in the, in the crypto space as well. So that's, that's kind of my take. It, it, it is against what I was doing years ago, which is so much more cash flow based, but I've got a good mix between cash flow investments and then more VC or longer term investments that hopefully I get my money back on. We'll see. Yeah. So before you mentioned there were three things that you look for when you were diversifying, it was like sponsors, asset classes, and, um, and geography was one. And geographies. Uh, does, does investment objective fit in there, meaning cash flow or equity growth? Like, how do you think about? how much cash flow that you want? Are you trying to meet your minimum expenses? Are you, you know, is it like, oh, crypto is down right now. So, you know, forget the cash flow piece. I want to just keep investing more in equities. You know, I don't know that that's, that's not, it's probably the way that you should look at it. Um, I think I just look at, <clears throat> I just look at overall, overall portfolio um, and, what do I have? So like I said, I want a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this. And that includes, you know, maybe half of it is cash flowing. The other half is not. So um, yeah, I think all of it is for net worth optimization. Uh, it's kind of where I fall in that spectrum. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly good to have some that give you some money back as opposed to waiting 10 years for something. Yeah, totally. Talk to me a little bit more about, uh, about, the investment strategy that you're pursuing now with the long game fund? Yeah. So this is a, you know, I had invested in 20 deals um, as an LP. And so I got to learn a little bit about how these funds operate. And I came across, I met two guys that were both in this group together called Go Abundance. And it's a, it's a great, you know, men's group, networking group. And uh, these two guys basically had been in the Bitcoin space for about, 10 years. They're owners of the Bitcoin magazine, the Bitcoin conference. And in a, in a group of all real estate investors, uh, you know, we, we sort of bond because we're the only guys that are interested in Bitcoin. Uh, you know, real, real estate investors are like, oh, it doesn't have a door. So it's got no value. Um, <laughs> right. And um, so our kind of thesis is that this, you know, cyclical nature of Bitcoin and crypto is going to play out again. Um, you know, it, it, it always, it's, it's a boom or bust scenario, right? You're either on top of the world in the crypto space, or it's like, it's a goblin town. And right now it's goblin town, right? It's been in the bear market for a very long time. We are starting to see some things move a little bit. And, you know, our thesis is that it's going to play out again in the next couple of years. And it all surrounds around the, the Bitcoin having. So in Bitcoin, every four years, the, uh, the, the actual supply of Bitcoin gets cut in half. So if right now, every, um, every day there's 
whatever, I think 900 Bitcoin that are mined that are brand new, like fresh Bitcoin. Think of it as like fresh gold that comes out of the ground. Uh, in a year from now, it'll only be 450 new fresh Bitcoin that come out of the ground. And so that's usually a, a crazy bullish catalyst for the next bull run. And a lot of these other asset classes uh, inside of uh, crypto all are sort of beta on Bitcoin, and then they run up significantly, sometimes in, generally even more than Bitcoin. And so what we want to do in our fund is we sort of want to spread it out across the whole space. So my partners, um, they've been in the game for a very long time, so they have very good deal flow with a lot of these managers. They know them all. Um, and so our idea is we want to get a little bit of, you know, let's say, um, discounted Bitcoin. We want to get a little bit of some VC in the, um, the Bitcoin application layer. We want to get a little bit of, let's say, DeFi. Um, and we think that putting that portfolio together gives you a, a great opportunity to ride the next bull, uh, bull run without having the crash. And so I think the, the big, most important thing for us is when we invest in things, having liquidity so that <clears throat> we've heard of a lot of funds where Oh man, they did really great. And MultiCoin is one. They did they did a hundred x right while they were while the, while the last bull run was going, and then guess what? They came all the way back down, and investors didn't get out in many cases. Though if if you look at, it, I think they're still doing pretty well. But um, the biggest thing for us is having liquidity at the time where you know, hey, the market's sort of getting oversold. We want to pull back a little bit and uh, capture some wins for our investors. So. That's that's the idea behind the fund. Yeah, as you've as you've started now going down this path of graduating from first being an entrepreneur, then investing in in other people's deals, uh, and then now starting to to run your own fund. What do you think are takeaways or learnings that you've had along the way? Because I'm imagining once you come to the GP side of the table. S- other things start to click. Oh, I understand why these fees are collected. Oh, I, you know, uh, h- how do you, what are those takeaways? Yeah, I will say I, it, you know, it, especially in the VC space, I didn't understand any of the, any <clears throat> in terms of fees when I was investing. Um, now I do. And <clears throat> I would say some of the, some of the big learnings is, uh, would be, you know, just how to communicate with investors. I think that is just so important. It's just like, if you're a doctor or a dentist, you know, half of it is the actual work product. The other half is the bedside manner and how the patient feels, right? Whether you're going to get sued or not. Um, and so I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, often uh, being c- communicative with investors as much as possible. So providing, you know, um, quarterly or even monthly updates, um, just letting them know, hey, listen, this is this is exactly what we're doing. This is what we're thinking um, and making sure that they feel comfortable, not over promising at all, right? Coming out and saying, Hey, listen, this is risky. Um, you can lose everything. Um, you know, we uh, we're very bullish on this plate on this, in this space, but um, just making sure to set the table for investors. So I would say um, understanding the fees is one and then how to communicate with investors because I've been on the receiving side in uh, 20 different funds. Yeah, a uh, uh, great example would be is especially as SVB collapsed uh, and having, you know, uh, there were many funds that came back said, hey, we had exposure or didn't have exposure and here's what we're doing. And there are some that, you know, waited two weeks and uh, you can already tell and sh- those are signs of cracking uh, of and sh- just expose good or not good communicators in the fund management world. Absolutely. And and I mean, you know, like, we want to do a great job, you know, anything that I do, I want to do a great job, right. And so um, if we do a great job for our investors, then there will be additional opportunities for us if it's other funds or other, you know, opportunities that come up. That's what we're thinking about. So we call the fund the long game fund. So we're trying to play the long game, right? Not take, uh, you know, short term wins at the expense of anything. So yeah, uh, what I'm also wondering about is, is okay, you've, you've invested in this whole magnitude of different asset classes. There's, you know, there's so many different things that you could be investing in PE, pharmaceuticals, you know, you even invested in distressed, 
properties? Like how, how are you going about deciding which ones to go into or, or is it just access or knowing people that are, that are in them? That, that is, I think the hardest thing <clears throat> because, uh, most, <clears throat> most people have limited capital, right. At some point. And, um, especially in the group we're in, I know hundreds of people that have, you know, funds and syndications and, um, and there's so many great opportunities that come up. So it's, it's really difficult. And I'm friend, you know, good friends with many of them. And I had to be like, sorry, I, I can't invest. You know, I, I would love to, if I had an, uh, a checkbook that was endless. Um, so I, I really think that that's the hardest thing. I think that there are so many great deals out there, especially if you have the network. Um, and, uh, and it's hard. And so I, I have sort of in the last couple of years, like I said, I've done a couple of deals every year, but, um, you know, now that I have a fund, you know, we, I, I invested as well as an LP in my own fund in a significant way. And then it's, it's very hard for me to, uh, to not invest in Bitcoin. Um, so that, that's always something that's, that's difficult. Maybe when it starts running up a little more, I'll, um, I'll be able to look at other things, but yeah, you, you just, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, what to pick so difficult. And, um, and I, and like we mentioned, we sort of have a good, I've got a good smattering of, um, of options there. So I feel like I'm sort of set at the moment, uh, but I'm sure I'll, I will get the itch in coming years to start diversifying again. No. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing everything here with us, Dan. Uh, enjoyed having you on the show and, and sharing your investment journey. Thank you, buddy. Always great to see you. Likewise, man.